I have two o'clock on the dot. Right. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Tuesday, February the 2nd strategic planning meeting. I now call this meeting to order. A uh, couple of items uh, we have this afternoon on our agenda is the enforcement and compliance. And also uh, under pending legislative matters, uh, STVR legislation. Both of those will be discussed by our uh, ever capable Councilman Erskine Oglesby. So Councilman, uh, you wanna take uh, the first one, the uh, LDO enforcement and compliance. You're, you are muted, sir. Yes, anybody from LDO here. Did y'all have an opportunity to look at the attachment that Nicole sent last uh, week? And I, she sent it right around when we was doing our three thirty meeting. Is, is I that, don't, I don't think I saw it, Councilman. I, I may, I may just have missed it. Is it, is it? Did it come from Jeremy Swilly? Uh, no, no. Uh. -uh. I have. Is that the one I sent to Newton? Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the Jeremy Ma Swilly. Oh, Madam, okay. Madam, Madam Clerk, uh, Dallas Rutker has his hand up. Would you bring him in? Please? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. All right, there we go. I, I dropped out there for a second. Didn't realize I started talking. Didn't realize I was muted. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah. hear you fine, Dallas. Okay. Uh, hold, hold on one second. Uh, that was, um, Madam Clerk, go ahead and bring Jeremy uh, Sweeley in as well. Thank He's you. got his hand up. I'm sure he'll be a tag team with uh, Mr. Rutker. Yeah. All right, Councilman, go ahead, sir. All right, Dallas. Yes, sir. Okay, I mean, it's probably going to be interesting because nobody has really seen the uh, the uh, document that was sent out um, last week. So could you um, give us a little snapshot of, of what that was about? And Ms. Well, I, I think... Jeremy might be the one. I mean, he put most okay. of this together. Of course, he might sure. be the one. Too. But, uh, you know, we, we looked at it. Uh, since uh, so a lot of the problems we seem to be having are with site development and stormwater plays such a large role in that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Jeremy Jeremy had those ideas. But, uh, I mean, I can be happy to discuss it. But do uh, you want to go ahead, Jeremy? Sure, yeah. I mean, um <clears throat> I think everybody's got a copy of this. I'm pretty sure I emailed it several times to everybody on the council. Um, it's basically uh, my attempt to come up with some ideas. Um, you guys had asked for some some more creative ideas um, and just some some basics uh, to to help with enforcement. To help, uh, you know, one thing I noticed early on when I took this job was. Uh, we were not collecting as much of our civil penalties as I, I feel like we should be. Um, we needed some new tools to be able to uh, get compliance uh, in a in a more efficient manner um, because we are we do tend to be very reactive. Uh, it's difficult to be proactive. So uh, honestly, I just it's a uh, it's an attempt to provide the council with some ideas. Uh, some options for enforcement. Some of them uh, I think are really good ideas. Others are not my favorite, but they uh, they are used in other places. So I figured uh, that's really more up to you guys as to what, uh, what the council likes rather than myself. So it looks like we need to revisit Mr. Chair, you don't have to unmute, but it looked like we, oh, uh, Councilman Burris. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jeremy, one of the things that I've been concerned about 
relative to enforcement is, and it falls right along with what you're talking about, is that very often we hear, well, it's a $50 fine and that's a cost of doing business. So why bother? Let's just pay the $50 fine. And one of the things that we had talked about was, it was there some way to um, add up that fine for days or, or whatever. And I think that the problem was the court was saying you have to go out there every day and prove that that this empty lot is still empty. I mean, it was just an absurd request. I'll do respect to the court. So what I'm trying to figure out is how can we, I have one in my neighborhood that's notorious for uh, doing probably not the right things. And he just smiles along and goes along because the worst that can happen is $50. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, so that's your, that is uh, unfortunately uh, not the first time that I've heard of that. Um, in fact, our MS4 regulations, which is how the state tells the city what we must do, allow us, in fact, require us to have a civil penalty process, which is not the same as the court process. We, in right. fact, do not take people to court unless we absolutely have to, because unfortunately, it is not very effective at times. Um, there is absolutely a time and a place for it, uh, but we feel like the civil penalty process is a more effective tool for us uh, in that we can go up to five thousand uh, dollars per day per violation depending on the violation type um, the problem we had is that if you know if i issue you seven thousand dollars of civil penalties over time on a project and you just refuse to pay them well then what does the city do uh, so we, we in-house, inside the LDO, we initiated a few things to, to, to help that as if uh, we will not release your CO, uh, that's the certificate of occupancy for your building, uh, until you have paid those fines. Um, that's, that's been effective to a, a large degree. There are many projects, though, that do not entail a building or an occupiable structure, so there is no CO to hold. Uh, we have we still have a big problem with people basically just ignoring those civil penalties because they know I, I really have not a, a no no real good way to collect them. Um, so that's part of some of what you'll see in this proposal. Uh, one of the items, for instance, and and I'm not uh, this isn't because it's a, a favored one of mine or not. It's just the one I happen to think of. Uh, one of the proposals is to require that contractor under his license to pay those penalties before he would be able to obtain a new land disturbing permit. Uh, that's something that I cannot do unless the council uh, passes that into the legislation, but it would prevent a guy from, or a girl, uh, from starting a problem over here and not fixing the problems and then pulling another permit on another lot somewhere else. Um, I don't even know if it's legal or not. And I, <laughs> That's why I asked for our attorneys and for the council uh, to look into that. Um, yeah. Spurs, there's about, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so what about if it's not with building? What about if it's a violation that everybody agrees it's a violation? Um, oh gosh, there's all kinds of things from short-term vacation rentals to, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, selling sandwiches out of your house, you know, whatever it is. Yes, what about those? So I don't actually regulate that. I, uh, I regulate active construction sites for uh, stormwater compliance, for erosion and sediment controls, for a whole host oh. of engineering requirements. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, none of the proposals you guys are getting from me deal with anything um, that's going to be what you're talking about, zoning, uh, issues like those. It, those those uh, do not have a separate enforcement clause that I'm aware of, and the court system is where those are handled. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Chair, I thought this was supposed, I thought this was, I apologize. I thought this was all zoning enforcement and not just in building. Is this just relegated to building, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? 
No, it, it was uh, well. We asked several several of those questions um, a couple of weeks ago when this was scheduled. So uh, we can arrange to get that particular group in here to, to address that issue if you like. Yeah. Yeah, right. That was the big issue in my district, okay. and I know it's in other districts. And I thought this mm -hmm. was to encompass all of it. Thank sure. you so much. Well, all yeah. right, Jeremy. All I right. Can, uh, I'd like to clarify a little bit too, Ms. Burrs, and I'm sorry to take y'all's time, but so we do actively inspect the landscape requirements. So if someone builds a new parking lot and they're supposed to put in trees, uh, you know, those landscape requirements like that, those are zoning requirements that my group does enforce and they are included in this, but that is that is as far as, uh, as our requirements currently go. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Gilbert. Thank you, Chair. Um, based on what I, my understanding is, when someone is building something in a neighborhood or even anywhere, if they do a violation <clears throat> that if you find them, they know they ain't got to pay the fine. So what can we do legally, Phil, that would give them power? Can we shut down all their um, activities until they pay the fine. What can we do to give them the strength they need to, to say, if we find you, we expect you to pay you, instead of doing what we're doing now? You there, Phil? Yeah, he's, he's muted. He's muted. Oh, there we go. The, the advantage of what Jeremy was just talking about regarding the stormwater penalties provision is there is a civil penalty there that at least they're authorizing the, uh, uh, I guess, an entity that is engaged with something to be subject to a civil penalty of up to $5,000 per day for any act that is in violation of our stormwater ordinance. That only came into effect after the Clean Water Act was in place and they were trying to make sure that regulations of cities were in effect that could ha handle that. The problem that you have with citations to city court uh, is that there is a Tennessee constitutional provision that has been in there since 1797 that only allows you to have a $50 fine unless there is a right to a jury trial. That provision was up for a, I guess, an, an, an amendment to change the constitution a few years ago, and it failed by a few number of votes. And because of that, the only thing that the city courts have the power to do is to side up to $50 and costs per day under the law, unless you want to give them or they can get uh, the power uh, to be able to have a jury trial, which most municipal courts do not have. So that, that's the concern that you've got in, in that section. Anything involving a stormwater issue has a lot more teeth in it under state law because of that Federal Clean Water Act than we do on normal things just because of a, a 1797 Tennessee constitutional provision. Uh, there can be citations per day. There can be costs per day for any infringement or violation of a city ordinance, but that's, that's pretty much the limit you got right now. What about if, say for example, they find them a thousand dollars or five thousand, whatever? Yes. How can we shut down their organization until they pay that fine? Well, I, I think that at least that that's what Jeremy was rec recommending under their sections in here that there would be no further permits be issued to that particular person uh, until they have uh, resolved that issue and that they would um, at least not be uh, allowed to go off on a, another job and start another job until they've rectified that problem. That's, that's one of the issues, and I think they are asking for that type of help. Okay, what about if a person uh, have other multiple jobs going on at the same time? Mm -hmm. Could they shut the multiple down until they pay that fine? Well, it's, uh, it's going to be an issue that there would be a, a, a method of appeal. Uh, they could go to the, uh, the, the stormwater board in connection with that, and then whether they could appeal on to court. But yes, you could do that, and it, it would be a, a situation of whether a court would enjoin us from continuing to uh, not allow someone to do other work. 
uh, the, the problem is overstepping too much in that regard over one project and they may have five that are going on that are being done correctly and one is a problem and then shutting all of that down. That, that would be an issue for the courts to decide. Cause what we try, well, I think the, the goal is to, to make them pay the fine. In other words, right now, they're not doing it. They know they can get away with it. We're trying to put, give them teeth enough to not allow them to get away with currently what they're doing. So how can we put that in a form to an ordinance or whatever it may be so that they can have power to make sure, ensure they pay their fine? Also, it's more, it's more money to the city too. Yes, sir. Well, uh, stopping them from doing other work on, on jobs until they have resolved the problem that they have in front of them, and then also um, at least uh, uh, paying any necessary fines would, would help in that regard, I'm sure. So what do we need to do to give um, Mr. Dallas and his team the power to do that? Well, I, I think Mr. Swilly has given you, a, a, I guess, a, a proposed enforcement protocol that at least was as of November the 14th. I don't know if that's the current one that he's talking about here today, but that, that provision here at least is talking about what would happen in those uh, stormwater situations that would help. And I, I believe that, that would be a good first step. So we need to put that... As part of the stormwater ordinance, yes, sir. So we need to make an ordinance. You're, he already developed the ordinance. We just got to look at it, talk sure. about it, and put it on, correct? Yes, sir. And that, that's one, uh, at least the, my copy is dated, uh, looks like it's been in uh, 19, November the 14th of 19. Is there a more recent version of that, Dallas or Jeremy? No, that's, that's something we put together, uh, you know, for the big projects and where we're having problems with the, the site. Jeremy put that together. I mean, those were ideas that we thought about that, that we had, you know, just the council asked for us to put a few ideas together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what we came up with. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. To, to, and then we have the smaller violations with the smaller fines. I'm not sure what we're ever going to do with those as long as it's a, a $50 fine and, and uh, um, you know, I mean, it's it's. I had Jeremy start because he had the nice written out thing, and then, you know, for for zoning and, and stuff like that, I'm not sure as long as it's fifty dollars. Um, and and now we have Councilman Gilbert's well well aware. We have uh, recently been given the uh, approval by the judge that it was okay to start sin, start citing every twenty four hours for a for a uh, uh, problem that we had that actually Councilman. Me and Councilman Gilbert worked together, I believe, one one afternoon. So, uh, and and he he kind of saw what we go through, and uh, we were a little short staffed. So I jumped out of the office and went. But uh, yeah, it's it's you know I'm not sure you know what I think the big project, some of these ideas that Jeremy put together. I mean that 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 there's not a fine involved, but it definitely you know slow it hurts their production at that point and that, and that may be better than than a lot of fines that we have and then we find you know quickly too jeremy can get we've we've got people whipping out the credit card paying twenty five hundred dollars worth of fines to get a project finished too haven't we jeremy yes sir we do and, and yep. phil to answer your question um may 26 2020 is the latest version of that i can resend that to everybody if you'd like yeah i need the most recent version the one i have is looks like it's in 2019 that's why i was questioning so, here. okay, so, go ahead, so, Councilman Gilbert. So, the next step would be Phil to, to take what you have that he made in May the 26th, 2020, and put into a form of an ordinance and yep. give it to us so we can talk about it and then put it on agenda if we agree to that. Sure. Okay. Okay, I'll great. Uh, one other thing that I would give you, at least in that regard, if someone is supposed to be getting a permit before they actually uh, do the work. Uh, there is the authority under your code right now and uh, Mr. Rucker would get a, a permit fee that would be two times the amount. So that's an additional cost that someone would have to pay if they're just doing work without getting a permit on the front end. And that uh, amount is not um, you know, just a, 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 a number that is a $50 fine, that is double the amount of what that permit would cost. So that's that's an additional enforcement method that you have currently on the books. 
Okay. We we use that often. I'm a, uh, hold on, hold on one second. Councilman Mitchell has had his hand up for a while. Uh, Councilman Mitchell, and then we'll swing back to you, Jeremy. Councilman Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and um, it, it, it's interesting, Councilperson Burris thought what this meeting was going to be about. I thought it was a, a beginning of an attempt to form a piece of legislation on steep slopes and floodplain, which a lot of this has to do with, as well as big projects, small projects, and things like that. Um, the question I asked a couple of weeks ago when, when we said we were going to have this discussion was I had sort of been led to believe, I'm not going to say it's, it's anybody's fault but my own if I'm misinterpreting this, is we were going to stop giving land disturbing permits until we had more planned documentation from builders of, 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 of those lots or, or subdivisions or whatever you want to call them is is that not true, Dallas, or are we doing land disturbing permits still without uh, knowing what they're actually going to do to, uh, to the land? It, as far as I know, I mean, we have, a, we have a plan. I mean, we know they're either going to put a house there. Uh, um, the, you know, the larger projects, there is, there is some ability for a five-acre tracks and larger to get the grading permit, but usually that's with the understanding or we have some amount of the project in that it's a real project, it's not speculative, but you know, there's still that ability. I mean, there's still that issue with, I can submit the plans, clear the land, and then it's a permit to do the work. It's not a, the city requires you to do the work permit. You know, anytime you decide to stop, I guess you can. And and you know therein lies an issue we don't see a, see a whole lot, but but usually we have a development plan, parts of a development plan, you know at least the footing and foundation details and and road building stuff before we let you start clearing the ground. So we understand it's just not a, a speculative stripping of the property, and we're trying to keep that down as much as possible as well. So yeah, yeah, the the speculative stripping of the property, I'm not sure any builder really does that uh, unless they're trying to make a point to somebody. But and I think that's happened a couple of times in the past, but, but I, I do think that we allow them to strip the land and we don't put any time frames or time limits or, or anything where they've got to take the next step. I believe we are constantly going back to them and making sure their erosion control is under is is up to code and things like that but it, it, it seems to me if if you folks are looking for tools to help you do your job and that's what i'm hearing clearly from you and jeremy then um it it, it, it seems like we ought to delve into that as far as okay somebody takes land and strips it and and two years later they're still planning on doing something but the damage that has been caused caused to their surrounding neighbors is 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 huge, and uh, because nobody really does a good job of keeping up their erosion controls, et cetera, and there's no way we have the staff to be constantly daily enforcing things to 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 go about a daily fine. That would be one person you're attached to this job. Go get the daily fine. Go get the daily fine. Go get the daily fine. So it seems we've got major gaps here that we could try to address through ordinance uh, to help you do your job. Um, that's, that's a comment. I, uh, back on the note quickly about steep slopes and floodplains, I, I, I know I'm jumping ahead, but when we get to number three pending legislative matters, I still don't see that anywhere there. So I'm wondering when we're going to take the step to say it is a pending legislative matter about steep slopes. And I had to get that in. Sorry, folks, but I'll, I'll quit now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, wait a minute. We have uh, Mr. Swilly. You uh, what, got, had something you want to say and respond to what Councilman Mitchell was speaking to? Uh, I just think there's some misunderstanding as to what we review and what we do not review. We have an ordinance uh, passed in 2017 that clearly states that lots of record are only required to do erosion and sediment control. I cannot do anything else with that ordinance. 
uh, we do absolutely review drawings. Uh, we review a whole lot of drawings down here. If you can't just strip off land and nothing happens to you. I think what Councilman Mitchell's referring to, I, I hope, is these, uh, what we can, we term them as simple residential lots. So it's a lot of record in an already built uh, subdivision and someone comes along and plops a house on that lot. They have every right according to our current ordinances and laws to be able to do that. And I can't require much more than basically like an overhead satellite image where the person marks on there where they will put their erosion controls. Uh, and then yes, we, you are correct, Councilman Mitchell, we, we spend a lot of time uh, going back to those jobs because the, they are poorly maintained typically. Uh, those, those take a whole lot of time. How, having said all that though, I do not, I uh, am not trying to say that I prefer that we add regulations there. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that we're ready to handle that, but that's just my opinion. And, and a little, little bit on that end of it on my end, uh, there is a requirement that work, if it's done for stripping or is uh, filling for that matter, has to be done within one year of the date that they develop the permit. And if it's not done within that time period, then they're going to have to meet whatever the regulations are later on. Uh, the problem may come in whenever somebody's starting something and just stopping. And then what fine ability do you have at that point in time? Yes, sir. And we will actually revoke permits in those uh, situations. They would have to reapply. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, Chairman Henderson, please. You. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy or Dallas, um, if I'm if I'm just a landowner and I want to clear some trees on my property, I can come get a land disturbing permit to do that, right? Without having necessarily any plans to do any kind of building, correct? It is correct up until you clear five thousand square feet of tree canopy or greater. In that case, we would require engineered drawings. Engineered drawings for for clearing for clearing that, that's correct but i mean i still wouldn't have to produce a project correct as long as i showed you how i was going to clear where my sediment controls were how i was going to maintain it that's not necessarily correct because if that at that five thousand square foot of canopy mark uh we have the uh the tree oh my goodness i'm the, the, the tree ordinance permits, uh, I, may be, I may be missing that terminology. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, that requires you uh, to do additional items. We actually have a clauses in there where if you choose to just clear it and you're not telling us what the development's going to be, where your future permanent stormwater controls will be, and I'm not talking about temporary sediment controls, I'm talking about permanent stormwater mm -hmm. control devices would be, then we put a we have we have the right to put a three year moratorium for development on that property. Um, so, it, like I said, I, I think this is a we can get really deep in the weeds on some of these items. Um, so I, I understand it's not easy to know all this. Well, I'm just, I, I'm <laughs> just trying to I'm distinguish. Trying to I'm just trying to distinguish. Obviously, a developer is the landowner, and and. What I'm trying to distinguish between is what a landowner might do versus what a developer might do, and sure. and what you know what you have the right to do with your property. Um, uh, Jeremy, after uh, I, I I went back and looked at what you sent, I didn't realize th that's mm -hmm. what I I had looked at uh, these recommendations before. Uh, most every recommendation that you have on here does require. Uh, create legislation in order to enforce it. Uh, I, I'm, does, does that mean, and, and I'm going to give you a, for instance, one of them, uh, and, and let's say for, um, for uh, developers that, you know, are constantly in, in violation of the stormwater regulations or they have unpaid bills, uh, do we, can we not through even policy hold uh, like the CEOs, you've got in here a couple about, you know, holding CEOs even on other projects. Uh, so there's no way to create policy around that. I mean, that, in other words, you're saying that has to come in the form of legislation in order to be able to hold 
uh, COs for even other projects on uh, stormwater violators. That, that would protect your employees in connection with the city from some type of arbitrary action on their behalf of doing that. If there is a policy, it needs to be adopted somewhere by uh, the, the department or the council, one or the other. Um, okay. And, right. Go I, ahead, Bill. I was just going to say that, and Jeremy could say this, you know, where it's where it's in a, a subdivision and it's, it's the same contractor with or developer with six, you know, projects going on and four of them are dumping mud in the street, you know, we'll, we, we can issue a stop work order on that whole little section there. I mean, we've done that mm -hmm. to say, Hey, fix this, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, and then we've left a couple other projects maybe going in the same neighborhood alone. And then that works, you know, that, that works pretty good, but we just, anytime you can codify something, it makes it a little easier. And, and I know in the past we've said, we don't want to get too much of a laundry list in there because then anything that happens outside the laundry list uh, is, is hard, but, and, and we like to make policies, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, hard stop work and hard, hard fine imposals that, that, you know, are really going to, uh, you know, get somebody's attention monetarily, even if it's not a fine. So. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, there's, you know, some of these, a lot of these have workarounds, but the CO, Mm -hmm. there's, there's no work around the CO. I mean, that's, that's a, correct. I mean, well, that's, we've, um, I, I was just going to say, we, we've had uh, uh, two or three in the last week, we had to go out and threaten with the removal where people have moved in houses without the CO and there were issues. So uh, we're, we're working through that too. Yes. So I think we may even move back to the establishment of permanent power and not the CO because they get power and they move in and then it's, the, the, the person that buys the house starts getting penalized for something the contractor developer didn't yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's a good point. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, um, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I think this legislation probably needs to work in conjunction with our steep slopes ordinance that we're looking at. I know, and I know that we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at pre-construction, we're looking at construction, and then we're also looking at post-construction. And right now, I think our focus is sort of on post-construction. Um, I, I think maybe, you know, we, I think, I think a lot of what Jeremy has sent us is uh, pre or even, uh, con, you know, uh, during construction. So uh, it's probably something that we need to look at. Um, Councilman Ledford, are we going to discuss uh, steep slopes and planning and zoning today at all. We're going to have just got has his hand up. So you want to move, you want to say what you got to say, Councilman Ledford? Yes. And, and answer this you. question also? Sure. So my first question, let me answer uh, Chairman first. Uh, we're going to be talking about the vegetation component today, not not yeah. items yeah, that correct. we've been talking about today. And I That's right. yeah. really see those combining if we're going to move vegetation to an ordinance format, which we hope to do by the end of the week. I, I don't want to muddy the waters with, I think this needs to be a separate item. And I think we discussed this coming out of ECD, not actually planning and zoning. So um, mm -hmm. a lot of this conversation, I think belongs in ECD. Mm -hmm. um, my question to Jeremy, uh, are you still on Jeremy? Yes, sir, I'm here. Thanks. Um, a lot of folks come to us and you know we, we catch the, a lot of complaints and rightly so, that's what we're elected to do. Um, they're under the impression that clear cutting is allowed without any kind of a permission, so to speak. That, that's just what we hear. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that process so that if anybody's listening and for our education, we can more accurately describe to them step one, two, and three before they're allowed to clear cut uh, a piece of land? Sure, absolutely. Um, and I'd be willing to do this at any point with any of you, as I have with some of you on, on a, several times. But so if you're going to disturb roughly 1,000 square feet of ground, so that means you're exposing the soil to the potential for erosion from wind or water of around 1,000 square feet, then we do require a land disturbing permit. Typically, when you clear the land, uh, you're going to use heavy equipment. You're going to cause disturbance. If that is roughly 1,000 square feet, we have the right to require that permit. If you can clear that property without disturbing the ground, then that's not necessarily uh, a requirement for a land disturbing permit. 
up until you get to 5,000 square feet of tree. Hang on a second, Jeremy. What does that mean, what you just said? How do you clear and not disturb the land? You just can uh, use chainsaws and go by hand. Uh, so basically cutting trees down at the stump? Yes, sir. Okay, that's accurate. All right, I got it. Yes, sir. And now, as soon as you remove the stump, that's disturbance, obviously, because the soil is now exposed. Okay. Um, so that's that's really the key until you get to that 5,000 square foot of tree canopy, which um, I'd be happy to, you know, educate anybody on what that means, even though I'm not the expert. <laughs> um, so roughly when you get to that 5,000 square foot of canopy, um, the city council in the past when that ordinance was written, uh, based on evidence and scientific data and, you know, suggestions, thought that that was an appropriate number uh, because at that point you start to see stormwater runoff curves that change significantly enough that they thought at the time that that was where we would set that benchmark. So as soon as you clear that amount of timber from your land, theoretically it's going to cause issues for your neighbors and therefore you now have to provide us with a plan, get the appropriate permits, whether you clear it by hand and cause no disturbance or not. Um, you have a choice at that point. You're either going to do a development, you can give us a development plan, or you're just wanting to clear it out, which we do have people that say that a lot. Uh, but in that case, you suffer a three-year moratorium where you cannot develop that property. So, Jeremy, uh, is the 5,000 square foot canopy, is that measured by the drip ring? Yes, sir. It's, it's basically the same. Now, that's, that's my uh, layman's uh, understanding of it, and I have some experts who might give you. A slightly different answer, but yes, in essence. Okay. I'm, I've learned a lot about this so, through this process. So, um, so in, in essence, what you're, what you're saying is that when land is cleared um, and people have, and they come to us with complaints, that, that, that has gone through LDO, that permission has been granted or a permit has been issued. Either that or we will issue them a notice of violation, a cease and desist order, uh, and citations for civil penalties uh, for working without the permit. And that penalty is the notorious $50? No, sir. Um, no. So if you work without a permit, uh, your, your first penalty is doubling the permit fee. The second offense is $500 and then et cetera. It goes up from there. Okay. Who sets that fee? Those are all established in the existing stormwater enforcement protocol, which is in our stormwater ordinance. It's also one of the documents that I will, that I have sent that I will resend to everyone. Yes. Can council adjust those penalties? Yes. Up to $5,000. Yes. Up to 5,000. So we, okay. All right. I think, I think, I, I think we're hitting on some cylinders here, but we'll, we'll see. All right, Jeremy, that's all I've got now. Chairman, I appreciate, let me, Ask a question. No problem. Thank you, Councilman Ledford. Okay, I see no other hands. So one thing um, Jeremy and Dallas mentioned about possibly creating an ordinance for some of this. So what, what's the pleasure to Council? I know Councilman Mitch, you brought up some good points, and I think I know one of the areas you're talking about where they cleared it and just let it sit. I got some of those in St. Elmo also. So. Uh, where would y'all as a council like to proceed with this? Uh, your hand's still up, Councilman Led for you. Okay. Because I know Councilwoman Burris, she has some other. Councilman Gilbert oh. has his hand up, sir. Oh, uh, oh, okay. That couldn't tell from your pain, Councilman. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Gilbert. Uh, can, can, can Phil and Mr. Dallas and the other gentlemen get together and put put an ordinance so we can look at and then discuss? Phil? Yes. Yes. Because they are the experts of what they want to see. And then you are the lawyer, the expert of the legal part of it. And then you give it to us to look at it. And then we decide if we're going to go forward with it or not. OK, sir. Mr. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm going to suggest that a council person be part of that. I think, I think Jeremy Sweet, I think Mr. Sweeley is going to need a little bit of guidance in understanding what it is the council is looking for when we mm -hmm. put this together. 
I think I think maybe a council person uh, needs to be in that meeting, sort of guiding that uh, in mm-hmm. discussion, so that they understand what the homework is and they're not missing the mark. Mm-hmm. Chip Hill's a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to sit in on those meetings. Okay. So, all right, Councilwoman Burrs, I see your hand. Oh, uh, you're muted, ma'am. There you are. You're muted. Sorry. That's um, okay. Just wanted to follow up on your comment earlier. I do think we also need to discuss um, enforcement in general relative to zoning issues. Um, Every one of the ordinances we pass that have enforcement aspects to them in neighborhoods, I just need to know what the issues are. I know one of them is a $50 fine. I need to know if they need uh, more inspectors or whatever, but if we could put some time on the agenda uh, for that sort of discussion, I think our constituents deserve better. Okay. Uh, What's your pleasure, Mr. Chairman? I'd be happy to, we can either do it in strategic planning again, or we can do a a committee. Sound like we may even need to be a committee depending on how extensive the conversation needs to be. I I think I would rather uh, start in strategic planning. Excellent. uh, Sort of to develop uh, what we're looking for, and then sure. and then we can move it to committee at that point if we need to. Uh, I, I think an education session, somewhat similar to this, maybe is what Councilwoman Burrs is looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess if why don't you see when you can line up the uh, uh, the appropriate people, and then we'll mm-hmm. try to schedule it for our next strategic planning. Okay, so can we just make it a point to do it at next strategic planning meeting because we have two weeks to put it together. I think that'd be, yes. Okay. So Thank you, you hear, Madam Clerk, uh, two weeks, the next the next strategic planning meeting, we see <laughs> seven, nine, okay. And, and and this would be in reference to code enforcement. Is that correct, mm-hmm. Councilwoman Burrs? Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, yes. Anytime we pass an ordinance, that's a code. And so I guess that's where I got it in, confused. Okay. Uh, so yes, thank you. Okay, so Dallas and Jeremy, uh, y'all, y'all good with that? Y'all can make that happen, Mr. Chair. Yes. Got a hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, ahead, buddy. These little, these little new hands is interesting. I'm sorry, <laughs> Councilman Mitchell. You have the floor. Then Councilman Lett. Well, well, quickly, I just want to say that I, I don't think Councilperson Burrs has stumbled on anything. I think she's 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 got a a, a real issue. And it deserves a, t- a time of its own, and I'm glad we're doing it in two weeks. The other thing that you're sitting in with the attorney and and, and LDO, um, I, I want to reemphasize Councilman Henderson's point is that where we're going with the help of Councilman Ledford is post construction, and some of these things being brought up are pre construction and construction related. And so I don't know if we could bundle all that. That's too much to try to do. Uh, but but I think the Councilman Henderson, if, tell me if I'm wrong, we're, try, we're trying to point out possibly maybe two different ordinances uh, that we're going to try to work, one coming to post-construction and the other two or the other one, whatever it may be, coming at, at, at a pre-construction and construction. And it's not just to do with steep slopes and floodplains, even though I think you'd probably find the majority of our problems do enter from there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just wanted to reemphasize that and Council Chairman Henderson, tell me if I'm wrong. I think that's where we want to go with your efforts in the attorney and LDO. I think that I think that's correct, uh, Councilman. You, we are looking for a separate piece of legislation or ordinance uh, that, that probably complements, but yes, I think those are, I think those are two, um, two separate pieces of legislation. I don't want to slow down the post construction uh, in order to, to get the pre or the construction as well. 
Okay. Okay, uh, Councilman Ledford. Thank you, Chair. Before we move off this topic, uh, Jeremy and Dallas, can you put together a Cliff Notes version of some of the questions uh, or the process for issuing, I mean, that thousand square foot, the 5,000, all that is really good information. It'd be great to see in kind of a one or two pager Cliff Notes version so that we could have that kind of with us at times so we can understand that whole process better. I think it'd be great for us to, to have a reference like that. I, th I think we can do that. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. So what we're looking at is three pieces. Well, we got a, a information on code, code enforcement, but we're looking at a post-construction and pre-construction legislation. Okay, I, I see one, one head. Okay, yeah. so I, we got that clear. Uh, is there any other question? Then code enforcement will be in two weeks at our strategic planning meeting for education. It's excellent. All right. Is there any other question or discussions on this matter? Seeing none, uh, it's back to you, Chairman Henderson. Thank you, sir. Uh, but quickly before we, uh, and uh, Madam Clerk, you can excuse our guest, Mr. Sweeley. Uh, looks like Mr. Rucker and Mr. Rucker, I see him now. You can yeah. dismiss him. Um, before we go to our next uh, pending legislative matter, um, I do want to mention we do need a uh, attorney client privilege meeting today. And at 310, I would like to make sure that uh, we have everything wrapped up. I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to discuss what we need to uh, in attorney client. So I would ask that by 310, we have everything wrapped up. One thing that is not on this agenda that we need to cover uh, kind of under, under just other businesses, board appointments. Uh, but before we do board appointments, uh, Councilman Oglesby, I want to turn the floor back over to you. I think you had uh, maybe some short-term vacation, res uh, short vacation rentals, uh, some um, legislation that's being drafted at this time that you'd like to discuss? Uh, wait a minute. Let me, let me get you out of this way. Yeah. Uh, I think we. I'm going to need another week to make that happen. Is that right, Phil? Or did you, on the short-term vacation, the resolution to give uh, permission to look at um, some addition to that piece of legislation? I, I sent you what I had last week on here. Uh, I, I can definitely work on that. If y'all y'all get me any more information you want to change on that, I'll be glad to do it. All right. Can we defer that, uh, if you is, if you please, Mr. Henderson, uh, Chairman Henderson? Sure. Because um, I, I had nobody has seen it, and I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, uh, and, but but basically, Councilman, this is just a resolution asking yeah. RPA to draft some language, I think, around uh, um, non-owner occupied mm -hmm. rentals. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. Yes, yes, it okay. is, Chairman. All right. Uh, do you want to place this on the uh, on our next uh, strategic planning agenda? As if well? you please, sir. If, okay. if you please, yes. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, if you would um, make sure that uh, the short-term vacation rental uh, resolution and hopefully by then we'll have the piece of legislate or not legislation, but the resolution uh, for us to consider. You you will, and I'll make sure everybody gets a copy of it prior to that. Okay, uh, thank yeah. you very much. All right, so, Phil. So the next thing on our um, agenda is board appointments, and we do have I think uh, some resumes that were sent out, uh, some board appointments that need to be uh, made, Phil. One of the questions that arose, I think, was the health education and housing facility. And, and you will notice uh, next to that, it says districts one, two, and seven. But it's my understanding that there are only seven appointments on this board. And so therefore, they would not be individual districts appointing uh, strictly to this board. I, I think, uh, and, and either Madam Clerk or Mr. Attorney, somebody refreshed my memory, but I believe we divided this up into our uh, sections one, two, and three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, and nine. 
uh, much like we appoint right now, at least the IDB board. So technically, uh, uh, where it says districts out here, it, it should be whoever's um, section is next that would have an appointment to this board, I believe. Yes, sir. And, and currently the, uh, the board for the Industrial Development Board and also the uh, Health Education and Housing Facilities Boards are seven member boards by statute. Uh, that has not changed since they were originally created. We have created a, a charter amendment for both of those boards to increase that number up to nine people. Uh, the Secretary of State has uh, at this point in time not uh, uh, at least ruled on that amendment. We got to get that approved in their charters. Whenever that occurs, then you'll have one for each district on the council. As I understood it, y'all had a workaround where you were trying to make sure that at least there were more uh, people being able to make an appointment to the seven member boards until that was uh, increased in size. And that's the reason that you had three people in three different districts uh, providing input into that for the seven member board. Okay, Councilman Mitchell. I'm not sure I'm ready to get thrown into this or not, but I'm going to go. Go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 uh, yeah. I, I I sent around a couple of resumes. I have, well, I, I was told I have three appointments. Uh, one for zoning appeals, who I'll, I'll be next week reappointing Paul Betbys, um, and and then assign appeals, who I have a, a person to appoint. Um, but then when it came to health, education, and housing, I've run into a couple of issues. It was told me that I have an opening and then it sort of made itself and I've actually chosen a replacement for my person uh, even though it might not have been my person uh, originally uh, but it might have been a one two three I guess is what I'm saying when we appointed it um, but I have a couple of issues uh, I'm trying to get a new person on that board the person that's on that board as it turns out that is related to me or one, two, and three, whichever it may be, is Hicks Armour, and he is actually the chair mm -hmm. of that board. And what you have, when I looked it up, you have literally four people out of seven uh, terms ending right now. And then you have a couple of others that end in September, and then you have another person that's on there, and somehow they don't end until 2024. At least that's the information that's on the internet. And so... What I was wondering after having a conversation about Mr. Armour is, is what we can do. Um, my, my replacement for Mr. Armour is uh, Lieutenant Joseph Thomas from the Chattanooga Fire Department. And he, uh, he uh, is, is, is very good in the research I've done for all the way from what he does in the community all the way to North Georgia to the Chief of the Fire Department uh, speaking well about him, but what I was wondering as we're moving towards this nine person board, is there some way to accommodate a new person coming on, but Mr. Armour serving as chair through this transition of change and, and, and then going from seven to nine. I, time wise, I'm not sure exactly what I'm talking about, but as chair, um, maybe a few months that he could still remain as chair um, and then what, what, what to do with Lieutenant Thomas at that period, do we, you know, so, so, so I'm, I realize I just get one um, and right now I might not even get one. It might be one, two and three that gets the one. Um, but uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking for help from direction from the council on how I can, uh, get Lieutenant Thomas who started contacting me about really wanting to be on this board, I guess back like November. And uh, he's, a, he's, he's, I think he'll do, do well in it, but the lack of experience on that board, I'm also concerned about Mr. Armour as chair leaving that board right away as Mr. Thomas comes in. So I just, I'm just looking for help. And if that's what we, we got to do, that's what we got to do. And Mr. Armour totally understands but um, uh, I just, where, where should we go? Councilman, hold on. So let me suggest this. Um, Madam Clerk, 
it, it is my understanding that we need three appointments to the HEH board. We, we need three appointments. Yes. The internet says four. Uh, so, well, yeah. well, let, let, let's assume for just one second, it, it, and I guess Mr. Armour is one of them. Yes. But let's just assume for just a minute that there's three. Um, that allows for each section of council to place one person on that board. So in other words, one, two, and three is going to get an appointment, uh, four, five, and six, and then seven, eight, nine. So, um, uh, and I do not think that uh, Vice Chair Smith would have a problem with you appointing uh, Lieutenant Thomas as our nominee, one, two, and three. Uh, in fact, I would be in favor of that. You would uh, obviously be in favor of that, and that's two of the three. Uh, for the group of one, two, and three. So if you would like to, as districts one, two, and three, appoint uh, Lieutenant uh, Thomas, I would second that motion. I would be very appreciative of that effort. Thank you. Thank now, you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Councilman Smith. Um, <laughs> Mr. Attorney, did you have your hand raised? Uh, I, I was trying to raise it here. I, I wanted to at least make sure that y'all are aware too uh, uh, that uh, there are requirements under the state law as to boards of directors for the health, education, and housing facilities or, uh, corporation. And it doesn't allow any director to be an officer or employee of the municipality. That's one concern. Is he currently a city employee or not? Yes, he is. He is a lieutenant in the Chattanooga Fire Department. That's what I was concerned about when I heard that. And that that's one possible problem here uh, with him at this point in time, because that's that's what the Tennessee Code says, at least for those types of corporations. Mm. They can't be an employee of the city. Well, if that's the case, then um, I've got a phone call to make to Lieutenant Thomas. Could you please confirm that before I make that phone call? Yes, yes, sir. I'll send you a copy of this second, so you'll have it. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Mr. Chair. Uh, while we're here, let's go ahead and I'm going to uh, inform districts four, five, and six that you will need to make an appointment to this board as well as seven, eight, and nine. So if, uh, if everyone in those districts could be thinking about an appointment to this board, um, this board has been very active as of late, a uh, very important board, and we, and we do need to make sure that we, we have those uh, positions filled. Any other questions um, about this particular board or any other uh, board that needs appointments on it? And Councilman Mitchell, I understood you to say that next week, uh, you will need those board appointments listed under other business. Is that correct? Yes, the two, the two, the two, the sign appeals and the zoning appeals. And I'd like to make those announcements under other business next week, the ninth. All right, Madam Clerk, will you make sure those get on our agenda for next next Tuesday under other business? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm. Uh, I've got, I've had a question as to what the health education and housing uh, board is and what they do. Mr. Attorney, uh, just to make sure I don't, uh, I know they handle the housing pilots, but I'm sure they, it's a much broader board than that. Could you uh, kind of just give us a synopsis, please, of what yes, the board sir. handles? Yes, sir. It is a corporation that is independent from the city in that regard, and it has to be uh, at least uh, it's established under Tennessee law to actually issue, um, I guess, bonds uh, on behalf of lower uh, costs for uh, financing for a number of businesses. So a lot of times we have requests for uh, bond issuances for uh, large um, multifamily uh, construction projects, sometimes for hospitals that come to us and sometimes educational institutions that come to that board. Uh, we've had requests from, uh, I guess, the, the folks at uh, uh, I, I, uh, 
guess, in Collegedale for uh, educational purposes. We've had uh, requests from uh, some of the private schools here in the city. We've had requests from, uh, I guess, a number of the hospital authorities here for uh, Memorial Hospital, uh, for Park Ridge at times. Those, those types of entities have come to this entity to try to get lower costs on bond financing. Uh, they also uh, administer some of the grant funds that the, uh, this uh, particular council has created for low and moderate income folks. If there's small uh, uh, opportunities for that to occur here for uh, housing, that, that is involved in that group, as well as implementation of the pilot program, because under state law, that board has to take title to the property during the time of any pilots. And they uh, at least are a nonprofit corporation, so there's no taxes increasing other than what this council and this, uh, the county approved for payments in lieu of taxes during that term. Usually that's for about a 10 year time period. So this entity actually is the title holder of the land during that time period. But that, that's my understanding of it. And, and it's good to have some type of, uh, I guess, rotation is involved. And I'm, I'm forwarding a copy uh, to Councilman Mitchell here at this point in time of how they normally like to have the rotation going on the groups so that they have six year terms. So there's some continuity of memberships going on and off. And I'm not sure we're getting that all the time, but- Go, that, go ahead that really and send, send that information to all the council. I will, I'll just send it to everyone as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, Councilman Ledford, new hand, sir. Yes, sir. I just have a technical question. Um, the Health Education and Housing Facility Board. Did I hear you just say District Four needed to make an appointment because we did that last week? That's what I thought. We just had a new member here this last meeting. Well, Dr. Then, John Schreer was appointed from District Four oh, last. Week. Okay, so maybe we don't. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Well, Madam, Madam Clerk, would you check and see how many appointments needed to be made on the HEH board? Yes, I'll check. I, I'm, showing, I'm showing three currently that we need to make. Yes, I'll check on that. For okay. It will, uh, we'll have that by my next strategic planning. Any more goats you want released? You, you've released enough goats, I think, for this meeting, Councilman. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, the rest of our agenda for strategic planning uh, can be covered, I think, during our 3.30 agenda session. So is there any other business before we go to attorney-client uh, that we need to address before we adjourn? Uh, Mr. Attorney, you still have your hand up. You. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't, I've been trying to type at the same time, sorry. Okay. All right, anything else that needs to come before the council at this time in strategic planning? Okay, uh, if not, and Mr. Vice Chair, uh, I know that you're listening, would you uh, close us out and then restart the meeting? Uh, and Mr. Attorney, would you make sure that uh, Mr. Kelly, is aware that he needs to log back in at this time. I will, sir. All right, council, see you back uh, just shortly in a few minutes. Thanks.